Hi everyone, welcome to Good Day Chula Vista. Today we are on episode 72, so thank you so much for joining us again. <laughs> and today we have a very special guest. We're going to be talking about juvenile law, so please stay with us. You want to find out about all the changes, all the new laws, so please stay with us. Okay, so we're back. So today we have with us attorney Richard Arroyo. Hi, Gabby. Thank you. Fabi. Fabi. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much for joining us. I know that I've known you for so many years, Richard, and they, I appreciate that you're here, but um, they don't really know who you are, so tell us about you. Well, I've been in practicing law for 35 years. My office is in downtown Chula Vista, uh -huh. and I have an extensive uh, practice, both criminal defense, both adults and juveniles and uh, dependency cases as well. Okay, and how many years have you been doing this? I've been practicing for over 35 years. Wow, 35 years. So you started when you were like 10? Well, just about, <laughs> just about. And I originally had my office in San Isidro and now I'm in downtown Chula Vista. Yeah, you've been there in that office for a few years, right? About uh, 12 or 13 years. So when, when I started doing real estate, I had my transaction coordinator, Jesse, Jesse Just Transactions, and she's right. She used to be right next to your office, and that's how I met Richard. And at the time, I don't think you were doing real estate, right? I was not. No. Right. So he's also a real estate broker, and he does that for his, you know, his friends and clients and family and from for everyone. But the main, uh, your main passion is criminal law. Uh, criminal law, and I have a passion for working with young people through uh, through Rotary as well as uh, professionally. Mm -hmm. Through the Rotary? What is it that you do at the Rotary? Well, I was the past president of the Chula Vista Rotary Club, and uh, so I got involved with Rotary because of the various youth programs that Rotary offers, uh -huh. and uh, so I professionally for 35 years have been working with youth, troubled youth uh, and adults, and that's what attracted to me Rotary, and uh, I like giving back to, to my community. Well, thank you for doing that, Richard. Yeah, I think it's uh, there's more people like you needed in this community because there's a lot of, even though we live in a community where there's a lot of parks and community centers, you know, a lot of our youth, it's out there because most of the parents have to work nowadays. Before it used to be like the mom could stay home. Now the way the prices are and the economy in, in San Diego, especially it's so expensive, both parents need mm -hmm. to work. So sometimes there's nobody watching over the kids and they end up hanging out with the wrong crowd or, just getting bored at home and getting into trouble. Well, I think it's different these days because when I was growing up, uh, we didn't have cell phones, we didn't have computers, and uh, it's different uh, for kids are growing up now. Now they have the internet, and uh, yes. so it's a, it's a challenge uh, yes. these days, I think. I think it is, and it's a challenge for not just for them with so many things available. Like you said before, we didn't have all that stuff available when it was just when we were younger. I want to show you kind of what we look like here. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, how we are live. Okay. And then it's showing your name. We, I just want to show him on the screen what it looks like. And then right here we're going to start seeing when people start logging in. Okay. So that way we can see who's watching us. All right. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about juvenile criminal cases. So what are the difference? the differences between adult cases and juvenile cases? Well, generally, um, uh, if a person commits a crime, whether they're a juvenile or they're an adult, uh, it's still the same crime. Okay. But the adult system treats someone differently than the juvenile justice system does. Mm -hmm. I try to explain it to clients. Uh, if you're charged with an adult crime, the focus is punishment. If you're charged as a juvenile, the focus is rehabilitation. In adult court, use the word guilty not guilty in juvenile court uh, that word is never used so it's a it's a different it's a different uh, focus and there's also differences uh, in adult court uh, if a person is arrested and is in jail they can generally bail out mm -hmm. whereas a juvenile court case uh, there is no concept of bail I've had uh, calls from parents that uh, have had their uh, their child mm -hmm. in juvenile hall and they want to bail them out and I have to explain to them that you can't bail them out in juvenile hall uh, eventually 
and within 48 hours after someone is taken to juvenile hall, there's a detention hearing. So it's a little different mm -hmm. uh, focus. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and once again, the big focus is it's rehabilitation uh, as opposed to punishment in adult court. Another big difference is in juvenile court, there's no such thing as a trial by a jury. In adult court, if you get charged with a crime, you're entitled to have a, tr a trial in front of 12 people in the community, and they right. will decide whether you've committed a crime or not. In juvenile court, there is no right to a, a trial by a, by a jury, and a judge will decide whether the, uh, the, the young person committed the crime or not. Oh, so only the one person. Is that, is that a good thing? Well, it depends. I mean, generally speaking, in an adult case, you need all 12 to believe that you committed a crime. Right, you get at least a chance if you're guilty, right? That's right, that's right. So it's a little bit different in juvenile court, but once again, you know, the focus is different, it's rehabilitation. If I, for instance, as an adult broke into a home, I'm gonna be treated differently than as a young person that breaks into a home. I mean, they're immature, they're still learning, uh, and the system, the juvenile justice system, treats them differently. Right. Which I think is the right thing to do. I think it's the right thing to do, too. I, th I think it's it's great that they get another chance and that the way they're being treated, like mm -hmm. you're saying, to rehabilitate them so they don't, they can fix their lives, you know, like you said, they're young. That's right. Sometimes there's still that are, some that are already 40 and they're still immature. <laughs> well, that, that's true. That's true. So at least, so juvenile, is that 21 and under? No, it's 18 and under. So it's 18, yeah. not yeah. 21. No, it's 18. Um, as far as, for instance, purchasing alcohol, uh, you have to be over 21. Um, but as Or to far buy as cigarettes also. That's, well, I'm not sure about that. Yes. Okay, <laughs> well, I don't smoke anymore. But, but before, basically, it's the 18 uh, is, the, is the, uh, uh, you know, the, the difference. So if you commit an offense when you're one day short of your 18th birthday, then you're gonna be in the juvenile justice system, even if they arrest you when you're 18 and a half. Right. If you're 18, then you're in the uh, adult, adult system. Adult system, okay. Yeah. Well, that's good to know, you guys. Uh, it's, uh, it's good to explain this to our children, you know, as they're growing up and, and let them know the consequences that could come. So let's, that's my pen, sorry. Okay, so let's talk about, um, so how minors are treated as adults. Well, before, uh, if you were, uh, if you um, a minor and you alleged and you committed a serious offense, for instance, uh, you know you assaulted someone uh, or uh, you murdered someone, for instance, mm -hmm. then there was a certain procedure where uh, the district attorney could ask the juvenile court to find that you are unfit for the juvenile justice. Uh, system mm -hmm. and then uh, basically there would be a petition where the prosecutor would ask the judge to find that you're unfit and then that you should be tried as an adult. Now the law recently changed in January of this year where now if you're 16 and under regardless of what you do you cannot be treated as an adult. So if you have a person who's 15 years old and they murder somebody uh, the law was changed once again in January of this year where you cannot be tried as an adult. That's great. I mean, I think 15, when you're 15 years old, there's no way you, you're all there to make decisions. I think it's definitely you should be treated as a juvenile. And there's also a safeguard. If you're 13 years of age, uh, a judge has to basically have a dialogue uh, with the juvenile, whether they understand the difference between right and wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's the first step, because if a judge isn't satisfied that a 13-year-old or younger knows the difference between right and wrong, well, then they can't be held uh, criminally responsible for their conduct. Right. And typically the question is, well, do you know, uh, you know, the stealing is right, wrong, it's wrong, and who taught you uh, uh, right from wrong, it's my parents. And then once the judge decides that, uh, that, you know, that you know the difference between right and wrong, and then you can move on uh, in the system. Right. <laughs> well, those are all options, and, and it's good to know them, because sometimes when our kids do something and we don't really know, it, it's, it's scary. Like, we don't know what the law is, how we can help them. So it's good to at least know all these things. So now let's talk about uh, police options with minors. <clears throat> well, I guess an example that I try to use is that, for instance, let's assume uh, your, your son or daughter is caught uh, stealing something at Target. Mm -hmm. So typically in the city of Chula Vista, the police agency has a diversion program. So mm -hmm. what would happen is they would, uh, uh, security from the store would call the police department, police officer would arrive on the scene, and then basically interview the, uh, the young person and try to reach the young person's parents. Now, if the parents 
uh, can be reached and they appear to be responsible individuals and the, <coughs> the young person is like a first time they've done something like this, the Chula Vista Police Department can decide to basically handle it within the police department and not send it to the probation department and not send it to the district attorney's office mm -hmm. for the filing of charges. It's called a diversion program and the whole purpose is to try to you know, get the young person's attention, assuming you have responsible <coughs> parents, mm -hmm. uh, and to give them a chance to, uh, to do the right thing. And typically they have to do some community service work, they have to stay out of trouble for six months. And then as long as they do that, well then that'll be the end of it. If it's a more serious case, a police officer at that point in time can take the person directly to juvenile hall. Uh, so the police officer have different uh, options, uh, you know, to try to, um, you know, to try to evaluate on a case by case basis. Right. Because some parents, frankly, I mean, I hate to say this, but the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And a lot of times, you know, you have a parent that, uh, you know, that... Uh, it's just that's irresponsible. Well, it's just trying to protect their child and regardless of what the facts are, um, and that will always leave a bad impression in police. And then uh, oftentimes, depending on the crime, they'll take them to juvenile hall. Yeah, if they see their parent is not even surprised that the kid is doing yeah that's true a lot of parents uh we can become protective you know i, I mm -hmm. think that it's you never know it's hard being a parent you know you're not trained how to be a parent and and you think well maybe i'm i'm supposed to be on his side but sometimes by doing that you're doing the wrong thing you know sometimes it's better to just be like no you know you're on your own you did this and these are the consequences and yeah. let them it's hard to let them fall and not be there to catch them but i think it's it's a uh, we're not helping them when you do that, so I think. And, and, and technically, the client is the minor, mm -hmm. and the parents are not my client, but I always, in my practice, have always involved the parents because eventually, uh, if the young person is, is uh, released from, from juvenile hall, they're going to be going home with their parents, right. not with me. <laughs> so I oftentimes tell the parent that we don't know what happened. You weren't there. I wasn't there. Right. The only person was there was your child and perhaps some other witnesses. So. We never know uh, what the truth, uh, you know, yes. what might have happened. Right. So your advice is that we're not overprotective and we deal with reality? Well, we all raise our children. We like to think that, you know, we've taught them right and wrong. Stealing is not the right thing to do. But, uh, you know, frankly, I mean, you know, who you, who you hang out with uh, is basically, yes. you know, um, who you, you have problems with. I, I've, I've noticed over the years that, the young people that I find that do not get in trouble are the ones that go to school every day. Uh, they arrive on time, uh, they behave when they're at school, they get passing grades, and they're involved in other activities like After sporting school. activities. And the ones that, uh, that don't do that are the ones that tend to get in trouble. Now don't get me wrong, I've had an honor student before uh, who got in trouble before. He got in, a, he got in a fight with his girlfriend, he threw a rock through her window. So there's an honor student that did something that he shouldn't do. So honor students also get in trouble. Right. But generally speaking, the ones that uh, you know are just kind of you know not involved in in, in good activities, mm -hmm. sporting activities. There's there's statistics that have shown that individual young people that are involved with sports they have a tendency to do better because they right. you play by the rules. Mm -hmm. You know that there's always there's usually a winner and a loser. You know good sportsmanship. So. Statistics have proven that uh, that is a good uh, thing for uh, parents to get their children involved, involved in, uh, in, activities. In, sporting in sporting activities, right? Yeah. Also, I, I most of the cases that, that I've seen when somebody steals something from a store, it, they out, usually do it with someone else. It's usually with a friend. It's, it's hardly ever by themselves. Like most of the kids that are doing that is they're either showing off with their other friend or they just think it's a good idea. It, usually, especially here when I've seen it happen in Eastlake, it's not even things they need, you know. Their parents are even embarrassed, like, really? Did you need that? I could get, it, it's just more like of showing off with the wrong friends that they're hanging out with. I think they do it as a group. And that's part of the problem with gangs, is, uh, you know, you have an association of, the, you know, of, 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 of bad people, if you will, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if they were by themselves, they might not, not have done something, but once you're, uh, you know, you're in a gang or you have a... Peer you know, pressure, the well, wrong that, that's pressure. that's part of it. And, uh, and gangs are very, very serious and very dangerous situations. Right. Well, so many things to pay attention to. So I think it's, it's a good idea if we have minors at home to make sure they're involved in sports and involved in other activities. And, and parents need to be involved in their children. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've had parents tell me, 
or my child isn't involved in the gang, or my child doesn't use drugs. Yes, they do. You know, you just and, they, don't know. and they don't know about it. You know, <laughs> yeah, and, that's and true. you know, and they need to. If, if there's a reason, search <coughs> them, search yeah. their room. And uh, you know, when a young person says, you know, well, I have privacy. Well, no, as long as you're living under the roof of your parent, shelter, food, they're the ones that control. Right. I think sometimes our kids don't see that, and and we come across as parents like we're being mean. And I think you know, there's there's those things that you have to follow you know you're under my you have to feel that you're doing the correct thing when you're saying yeah there's no privacy here like i'm supporting you you live in my house and i'm responsible and we're doing it out of love not just to be invasive in their space we're right. doing it because we want to make sure there's nothing going on and you know some it's hard to have that relationship with your teens when they're going through that stage and you have to be, you're scared that they're going to be involved in something wrong. And then at the same time, you don't want to lose that relationship with them. It, it's hard, but I think it's, if you're doing it out of love, things will get fixed after. You know, you might have, you know, some turbulence with them mm -hmm. at that age, but eventually when they get older, they'll see like, okay, she was doing it for the right reasons. So it's okay if they hate you those, <laughs> those years <clears throat> for going and searching their rooms and checking their phones. I know that I used to do that and he was, you know, obviously they were upset and right. that I had to go through their phones and their rooms and removing their doors from the room. <laughs> I think there was a time I even removed the door. I'm like, okay, no privacy. There's no door in you. I was just so upset. And, you know, we do things like that, but uh, especially as single parents, we have to do that because that way they don't have to end up in, in jail. That's right. I mean, they make uh, mistakes, and you know, I tell young people I'm still making mistakes at my age, but yeah. my mistakes now aren't quite as bad as uh, they were when I was younger. <laughs> okay, so let's let's continue all these things. This is important stuff. If you guys have any questions, please ask. Especially if you have teens and uh, you know kids under 18, ask the questions, and we'll ask. I know there's some questions here, so we'll go over those. Um, so, what are the typical juvenile crimes that you've seen? Well, typical crimes that are also adult crimes is a lot of uh, assaultive behavior. There's a lot of crimes that I see at school um, where there's vandalism um, and uh, uh, fights at school, um, um, a lot of theft-related residential burglaries, mm -hmm. um, uh, breaking into cars. I see a lot of those. I see a lot of um, um, crimes involving, uh, once again, assaults. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes there's weapons involved, uh, sometimes there's not, um, and uh, sometimes there's, uh, uh, you know, sexually related uh, offenses as well. Mm -hmm. um, and frankly, I've seen just about everything over the years. One time I had some young people, they were driving in a, in a drive through like at a jack-in-a-box. They drove up, and uh, to the attendant that was there, they shot him with a uh, paintball. Oh, my God. I've had another individuals, they were driving around in a car and there was a lady jogging on the side of the roadway and they threw an egg at her. She had stopped and they threw an egg, hit her in her kneecap and fractured her kneecap. Oh my so, God. So, I mean, these are young people. I mean, I've had some individuals that uh, they were driving around in a car and they had the, the mailboxes that were detached from the single family home mm -hmm. with a baseball bat, they were hitting them. So I've seen it, nothing surprises me anymore. <laughs> But once again, whether it's a, an adult crime or a juvenile court crime, the, 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 the law itself applies to both adults and to juveniles. Yeah. So I've, I've seen it all. Fabby. You know what, it's, it's um, us as parents, especially when the kids are in school, sometimes we notice things because we're paying attention to our kids and when they get home and the way they're acting. And I remember I had a situation once. It's really hard because sometimes you want to tell, you want to get information out of your son, and they're afraid to tell you because they're, you know, they're afraid of this person at school, and they don't want to be the one saying. And especially if they know that the mom is the kind of mom that's going to go to the school and file a report, which was the case with me. And I remember that I started noticing things, and I, I went to the school, and I said, you know, I need to make sure that somebody's checking out on these kids, like what's going on at school. And sure enough, there was another kid, they started searching them, and there was another kid that was selling drugs at school. So the, when they started searching, they found them. And of course, my son was scared. Mm -hmm. You know, he's like, oh my God, mom, I can't believe you did that. So I think it's important that we protect our children and let them know that, yeah, they might be scared, afraid of that person, 
but it's from their own benefit that somebody puts a stop to those kids. They're not that strong, and sometimes they're afraid to tell us, but when you see something like that, instead of just saying, oh, don't hang out with that kid, you have to go and report it. And they, there's ways to do it um, confidentially, but something has to be done, so they don't just stay quiet because I think it, it's hard on the kids, right? Well, it is because I think they know right from wrong, but I, my experience has been that the school officials uh, as well as law enforcement try to protect them to, you know, to, to, you know, so that nothing happens to them. Mm -hmm. So Karen is asking, what, can parents be held liable for their kids' mistakes? Many times kids get in trouble because parents, let's see, are not paying enough attention to what their kids are doing. They can be. Um, some, for instance, uh, recently there was a young lady that, uh, you know, that set fire and there was a big, huge fire and it caused millions of dollars uh, of damage throughout the county of San Diego. But there's certain limits where a parent can only be held responsible for a certain amount. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, even if you have an absent parent, a parent that lives in another state, um, that person, that parent, you are the parent of the child, you are going to be held responsible uh, for the damages that the child uh, uh, commits whatever they meant because that, that's always in any type of case where frankly adult or juvenile restitution the damages to the victim um, are always uh, very important and the, the court system takes considerable um, um, efforts to uh, to make sure that they're compensated so to answer uh, that uh, Karen's question uh, parents are held responsible uh, for, for damages that oh my god commit. one more reason to keep them on a leash <laughs> right Especially we're you know we're working and our kids are doing yeah I think it's it, I think it's that's the way it should be because that forces us to be more in control of what our kids are doing especially if we know we're gonna have to pay for the damage. Okay, so um, let's see. Don't forget that all of you that are asking the questions we're gonna give the gift cards at the end of the show. So I see a lot of um, l let's say hi to some of the people that are here just okay. so you know. Let me see. We have Esperanza Close, Happy New Year. We have Salvador, hola. Marta Garcia from Escrow, Esperanza Close. Erika Gutierrez. We have Karen Vargas. We have Donna, Dana, Ana Hueso. And we have Luis Isais. Thank you so much for joining us. And <coughs> we have Leti also here. So um, let's go to the next question. So. Let's talk about the sentencing options for adults and juveniles. Well, generally, and once again, the uh, juvenile justice system treats juveniles uh, differently. So initially, um, once a juvenile uh, admits uh, that they did committed a crime, then they're gonna be placed on probation. And generally, uh, what happens is that the probation officer will write a, a social study for the judge, baiting, letting the judge know about any prior criminal history, uh, any substance abuse issues, gang issues, counseling issues, how they behave in the home, and we'll make a recommendation to the judge. And typically it's probation uh, for a year and there's certain circumstances, they're gonna have a curfew, they might have to do some community service work. If there was any substances or alcohol involved, there are gonna be some random drug testing. So typically the juvenile justice system tries to allow the young person to remain in the home mm -hmm. uh, under conditions of probation. And then as things start to get uh, worse where they're uh, violating their probation then at that point in time they might be removed from the home they might go to a camp program temporarily for instance if the young person has a substance abuse issue a lot of times the courts will allow that or order them to go to a, a, a facility where they get some forced sobriety and uh, so that's the first thing and then as they their conduct continues to accelerate uh, then at that point in time, they might even end up at the uh, Department of Juvenile Justice, which is uh, like prison for young people. But it's a graduated situation, um, uh, and the system tries to, you know, to try to rehabilitate them, to give them um, uh, a goal to mm -hmm. successfully complete uh, their conditions so that it, at the end, they can get off probation successfully and have their record sealed. Right. So anything yet that you do as a juvenile, it follows you as an adult, it stays on your record? Not necessarily. I mean, in the juvenile, Bless you. Ju <laughs> in the juvenile justice system, uh, if you successfully complete your probation, uh, you have a right to have your record sealed. And once it's sealed, generally speaking, no one can have access to it um, uh, in the, in the uh, private sector. 
Uh, but if you're not successful on probation, juvenile court probation, well, then your record won't be sealed, and then it'll uh, be open for it'll be, it'll continue. Be open. Oh. That's correct. So let's talk about DUIs, because um, I had a DUI in 2005. And at the time when it happened to me in 2005, I was so embarrassed, like I didn't even want to tell. I felt like a criminal because I had never, ever been arrested before. It was like a big deal. And I thought I was going to lose my real estate license, and I thought it was the end of the world. And I had gone to a wine tasting event for work, and I was tasting wine. And it wasn't that I was drunk, but I didn't know my limit on drinking, and I was at, at the... They said I was at the limit, but they couldn't get it, the machine to read it that way, so they kept trying it and trying it. And I was able to get it uh, removed. I got an attorney because I, I, there's no way. That was like five hours ago, and there was no way. But anyways, I was able to get it removed. But I remember that the judge said, if you really don't drink, then you have no problem being on probation three years and I want you to still do these classes. And I remember going to those classes with like real alcoholics, but I remember that I learned so much. So I think it was a good thing that they put me through those classes back then. Because, and, I don't, I, and I don't think it was such a big deal like it is now because it was in 2005, but I know nowadays getting a DUI, it's like super expensive and the consequences are huge because there's so many people being killed by drunk drivers. What is the difference with the DUI from an adult to a juvenile? Well, generally, once again, I mean, the law is, is the same for both. For instance, if you're driving on the influence of whether it's alcohol, prescription medication, non-prescription medication, marijuana, uh, if you're driving under the influence uh, and uh, you get arrested, then that is a misdemeanor, driving under the influence. Now, whenever there's an injury involved, then it can become a felony. Mm -hmm. So if, you, if you're under the, well, if you're under the age of 21, actually, and uh, you get involved in some type of accident where you injure somebody, uh, obviously you're in the adult court system because you're over the age of 18, but if you were 17, you'd be in the juvenile justice system. So the, the crime itself, uh, whether it's a felony or misdemeanor, it doesn't make any difference uh, what your age is. It's just if it's someone was injured or not. Now, in the adult uh, situation, uh, there are certain consequences. There's a potential of six month uh, uh, license suspension. The fine is almost $2,500. And also, if you get a conviction as an adult and you reoffend within 10 years, well, then you can, you'll get uh, uh, sentenced as a second offender and then the consequences are more severe. In the juvenile area, once again, I mean, in, in juvenile court, first of all, you're under the age of 18 to be in the juvenile justice system. You shouldn't be drinking. <laughs> you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be uh, buying alcohol to begin with, and then you're <laughs> under the age of 21 as well. Mm -hmm. So there's zero tolerance for anybody under the age of uh, 21 uh, drinking and driving. So once again, with the juvenile, there's mandatory license suspension for a year. A juvenile can also have their driver's license uh, suspended for, uh, for vandalism mm -hmm. or for uh, potentially for a minor in possession of alcohol. So there's different ways uh, that uh, the juvenile justice system uh, impacts uh, uh, um, a minor's, not necessarily driver's license, but their privilege to drive. Right. And in juvenile court, uh, typically a judge will order them on probation and they have to go to a, 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 a victim uh, impact class uh, and there's a fine involved as well. And once again, they're placed on probation. The, 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 the advantage, if you want to look at it the way about a juvenile, is that once you seal your record, then it can't be used as a prior conviction. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's that's the good part. But that's you know, anytime you have a, someone under the age of 18 that's drinking, uh, it's it's a very serious situation. I've had a lot of cases where uh, you know people have uh, juveniles have seriously injured people. Right. I think it's uh, for some of the parents that they have younger kids driving, and um, I think it's always a good idea to have. Uber, make sure you have Uber on their app and that you have maybe your credit card on that Uber app because sometimes our kids are going out and if they already spend all their money, they are gonna try to drive or they're not gonna go with somebody else. And I think a lot of the times what stops some of these kids from getting Uber is like they cannot afford it because they already spend all their check for their part-time job. So I think it's, that's one of the things that I've noticed, like most of my friends have opted doing that, like I'm gonna let you have the Uber app and I am gonna pay for that, because that way you know your kids are using it, and I think it's, 
it's a lot less money that you will be spending than later if something worse happens. So, you know, what can it be? Seven, eight dollars for maybe 20 if it's at night, but it's totally worth it to put your, um, your credit card on the Uber app for your kids. And, and even when my daughter was young, I told her, um, of course, they didn't have Uber back in those days, <laughs> but when she was young, I, I, I told her that if you're ever out drinking or you're with somebody that's been drinking, don't hesitate to call me, whether it's in the middle of the night, I'll come and get you. I won't be upset with you. I won't punish you. That's responsible behavior. Right, exactly, because sometimes, you know, parents do get upset to be called in the middle of the night, but, yeah, you, we have to make it an effort to, even though it's like, oh, my God, I have to get up to just do it, you know, in a good way so that way they do it again. They call us when something's going on. Now let's let's talk about what is the system doing? What are they what what are they doing to rehabilitate the minors? Well, in 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 the juvenile justice system, um, a lot of times there's a, there's usually a lot of substance abuse issues going on. Mm -hmm. So the young person will be ordered to randomly drug test as well as to participate in some type of outpatient uh, um, alcohol or drug treatment program. And if they can't stop using an outpatient, well then there's residential treatment facilities where the court system can order a young person to go to uh, a six to a 12 month uh, inpatient residential treatment program. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's you know, one option that's available for the court. Uh, um, because you know, some young people, I mean, you know, they have alcohol and then they have, uh, their, have problems with uh, crystal and uh, very rarely do I see heroin, but typically a lot of crystal problems and uh, alcohol and marijuana usage. Yeah. You know, um, Are there any laws with marijuana, just kind of like with the alcohol? Have they? Well, well, I mean, marijuana, it's different because now that California has legalized marijuana, recreational marijuana use, mm -hmm. I know the district attorney's office, at least in the adult system to begin with, <coughs> are starting to try to learn how to prosecute individuals for driving under the influence of marijuana because obviously when you're under the influence of alcohol the more you drink it starts to affect the larger muscles in your body to the point where you can't walk right you can't talk marijuana is different uh, but it still can be very very dangerous so that's another situation that law enforcement is going to have to try to uh, to deal with is a person who's under the influence of marijuana that's driving because marijuana, just like alcohol, affects your fine m m muscles. It's your eyesight and your judgment is what's affected. Right. And that's what can make you very, very uh, yeah. da very dangerous on the road. So just because it's legal that you can use it, it's not legal that you can be driving under the influence of that if it's affecting the way you see. That's right. You and, see. and at some point in time, you know, society is going to, you know, I mean, we haven't reached the point Set some in California limits. that you can't drink and drive. So as an adult, you can still drink and drive. Uh, but it's it's very dangerous. I just just recently, I think in January of this year, uh, a state I believe it's Utah lowered their uh, uh, alcohol uh, level to 0 0.05. Oh my it's, god! It's the most restrictive. But 0 0.05 is like two cocktails. So For me, it's like one. When I went to that school, that mm -hmm. class, it was like it, it's a, according to your size, or and weight, like your height and your weight. And I remember that it was like, if you have one cocktail, you cannot have a second one. Once you have that second one, you're over the limit. And mm -hmm. I didn't know that. I was like, I would think, well, I just had two. Well, yeah, it's already considered that you're drunk. So imagine 0.5, it would be like <laughs> half a drink it's, for the short ones. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's the most restrictive uh, driving on influence wow. measurement. And that's uh, where Utah? I believe it was Utah. Wow. Yeah, yeah just got enacted this year. Let's just not drink anything and drive. <laughs> well, I mean, there's another Stay home. designated driver, Uber. you know, and uh, there's other options that are available for sure. So, okay, uh, so that's how, Kara was asking, I know we went over that question, but how is the decision made on trying a teen as a child or an adult? So he was saying that when they're under 15, that's not possible. So let's say they're over 15 years old and somebody said, who makes the decision if they're gonna be treated as an adult? The judge does. I mean, the district attorney will ask the juvenile court judge to find that the circumstances of this individual is not appropriate for juvenile court. So that's the only way that they can get uh, uh, treated as an adult. Mm -hmm. and, and typically, um, you know, the, the uh, defense attorney will ask for a psychological evaluation to see if the person is uh, naturally aggressive or has severe substance abuse issues. So uh, the only the 
the individuals that frankly have a long history, juvenile court history, um, of uh, committing crimes, usually violent crimes, are transferred over into the adult system. So Richard, I know you have a lot of experience with the youth and criminal, uh, juvenile criminal cases and, and representing them in court. So can you work with anyone or are you just working with uh, the court system or can anybody call you well, and retain you? I, well, uh, Fabi, I'm a big believer in intervention. So, I mean, once again, I, even through Rotary, working with young people uh, and Frankly, the, recently the, there hasn't been as many cases filed in juvenile court, and we suspect that it's reason that some of these other interventions, uh, early interventions, uh, are working to uh, you know to help prevent individuals from committing crime. But I'm always available um, uh, for you know free consultations. I mean, I've told parents that if you see that your son or daughter is starting to go down the wrong path, whether whether it's substance abuse or whatever the case may be, reach out to me. You know, I'd be happy to, uh, if necessary, you know, take the individual uh, to court, let them say, well, this is where you're going to end up. Uh, sometimes they have tours of juvenile hall, which I think it might be an eye-opener for, uh, you know, for young people. So I'm a big believer in intervention, early intervention, and to keep them out of the juvenile justice system. Prevention, so, right? Yeah, and I'm, so I'm, I'm just a resource. I mean, I've been doing this for so many years. I have a lot of community resources, people that I can refer, uh, you know, parents to. Uh, uh, so... Yeah, you have an outstanding reputation with the community well, and the court system already. Well, I mean, I've been around a long time. <laughs> oh, and where's your office? So tell us about your office, uh, location, and what are your hours? Well, I'm in downtown Chula Vista, mm -hmm. and uh, some attorneys are very protective of their cell phone. I'm not, and uh, that's where my office is. But in juvenile court and the uh, in delinquency, juvenile mm -hmm. crimes, they're all... The, the courthouse is in one location. It's in it's uh, by Children's Hospital okay. in Kearney Mesa. Mm -hmm. That's where Juvenile Hall is, and there's another detention facility and uh, down by the border. It's called the East Mesa facility. Uh -huh. So I represent clients throughout the entire county of San Diego: Oceanside, Vista, oh. Escondido, El Cajon, uh, Alpine, uh, the South Bay. They all, when they're charged with a criminal offense, they all go to Juvenile uh, to Kearney Mesa. Okay. So. In, so that was another department. Yeah, so, but once again, my office is in Chula Vista, but, you know, and I'm very flexible uh, weekends, uh, so. Um, so his cell phone number is 619-370-9074, and we're going to have it uh, after the after the show. I'm going to put it on top of this uh, video so you guys can have his phone number, and I'm also going to put his website there so you guys can give him a call, visit his website if you guys have any questions or need his help. Uh, let me just see some of the comments yeah, here. Fabi, on my website, I have some particular information about San Diego County that explains the difference between adult and juvenile court crimes, uh, what, you, what you should do if your child is arrested. Um, so there's some pretty good, uh, helpful information on the website for people to just take a look at. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Visit the website and read it before it happens because you know what? Once something happens, you're going crazy. You don't know. And then people start giving you their advice even though they've never been in a situation. So it's always good that you go to the real resources and visit an attorney's website and find out what it's really, what you're supposed to be doing and not, you know, start wasting money on things that are not really going to help you. And you speak to an attorney that's going to tell you the truth. I mean, I'm an attorney amongst a lot of attorneys, but, you know, there's one thing that I always promise my clients is that I'm always going to tell them the truth because that's the type of attorney that you need. Yeah. I'm going to tell them the good as well as the bad. <laughs> I know, even if they don't want to hear it. Oh, yeah. So Eric is saying, great topic. Um, great information. Karen is saying also great information. Happy New Year. Um, let's see. Salvador, yes, steer the youngsters from juvie and not get caught up in CYA, Youth Authority Jail or Upstate Prison. They need yeah. support systems to direct them to not getting caught up in barrios and influences where they will pay the price. Well, yes. you, who you hang out with is uh, very, very important. Yes. Uh, Martha, this is very informative. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Tony. Thanks so much, valuable information. Lula is also saying, wow, great information. Erica, great tip on the Uber. Um, Carolina, yeah, Happy New Year. Great. Okay, well, I think this was really good information. I, you know, I do have a lot of friends that still have 
routines, and I think it, this is um, this is good information because now they know who to call. I mean, we've had a couple of attorneys here before, but nobody that specializes in in juvenile cases. So this is great. Well, our youth are our, 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 the youth is our future. Yes. You know, so we need to take care of them and we need to guide them. And uh, you know, over the years, I've tried my best. Yes, you have, and you're so involved in the community. That's also, I mean, I think, uh, what do you think our, our youth can be involved in? Besides, the, you know, doing these other classes, what other things do you think they can get involved with the community? Well, I think uh, even nowadays, through Rotary, uh, we have, uh, well, we give scholarships, and I've noticed that now some of the schools require, um, you know, uh, before you can graduate to do some volunteer work yes so I mean that's a good thing I mean it's required uh, and sometimes if you're put on probation it's gonna be required by the judge as well but you know getting involved uh, you know uh, in community service whether it's giving meals and uh, Thanksgiving uh, you know that type of thing getting involved in sports I mm -hmm. mean sports is a it's, it's a it's something and there's some type of sport for somebody I mean you know even if you're not a football player I mean there might be something that you can do right. where you're competitive where you're dealing with uh, rules right that you need to follow teamwork and teamwork as well yeah and, uh, um, and I remember when I was in high school I played football and some of my friends are still my friends to this day you have right. that you bond that really relationship friendships yeah. yeah so and as parents just be very careful about who your child is hanging out with um, that's very very important you know don't have your head in the sand you know be aware of your surroundings and your children right okay so let's kind of recap of the things that we can do like uh, Richard was saying he likes prevention more than like dealing with problems it's like helping them so they don't get in trouble so one thing we say you know against their will you know they're still under your roof and you might be responsible for the consequences so search the rooms make sure nothing weird is going on if you you know your gut is usually right if you have this gut feeling and you're thinking oh my god i'm just thinking being negative no as parents when we have this gut feeling it's usually right so if you're feeling like i'm gonna go and check my kids room do it check the phone uh, especially if you're paying for that phone get them involved like richard was saying make sure you're paying attention who are they hanging out with you know take the time to go pick them up at their friend's house to go drop off the friend meet the parents who are they what are they doing because that's how I found a few things that really, you know, saved me a lot of trouble with my kids by going to their friend's house and meeting the parents. And then you can tell you should, if you can tell right away if you want your kids hanging out in that house or not. Yeah, you can. Right. So that um, making sure they have their Uber app on their phone if they're going to be uh, going to a party, make sure that they're not driving back. That you're not going to get upset if you're getting a call to pick them up. So that way they can do the right thing, like Richard was saying. That's the responsible thing to do. And keep, keep them safe, for sure. Keep them safe. And others as well. And others, because, yes, sometimes they kill someone because they're drunk, and then that ruins their whole life, these kids, you know. Okay, so let's do the ruffle for our, um, for our viewers that made a comment and asked a question. Also, while we do that, um, do you want to mix some? Um, I'm going to invite you guys. We have an open house this weekend, so I'll give you the address right now. But let's do this raffle. Okay, Richard, so we're going to pull out two names, and we are going to give them a Starbucks gift card. Let's okay. do it. The first one. Can you pull it out? Okay. I'll pull it out. Let's see. I usually never pull them out. It's usually our guests, but... Hi. <laughs> it's too... Oh my gosh, I don't think they're stuck together. Oh, there it is. Lula, Lula, congratulations. This is the first time I see you on our show, so welcome to our show. I'm gonna uh, have Veronica reach out to you so she can send you your gift card, and let's do another one. Okay, I'll pull it out this Pull time. it out. <laughs> let's see who the other one is. I know there's like, there's too much glue on that. <laughs> We to follow them the opposite. Mm. Salvador. Salvador, yay! <laughs> it's our loyal viewer. Okay, so Salvador and Lula will reach out to you guys to get you your gift card. Thank you for uh, joining us. And we invite you. We have an open house this Saturday and Sunday here in Chula Vista. We have a brand new listing on 1539 Sonora. Drive Unit 275, it's a really nice, totally remodeled condominium. It's a townhome with the yard, with the garage. 
three bedrooms, two two and a half baths, and it's listed for three hundred and ninety five thousand dollars. It's on my website if you guys want to see the picture. Uh, but Luis is gonna be there on Saturday, and Victor is gonna be there on Sunday. So come and see us at the open house. Do you have any listings right now that you wanna uh, share with I them? do not. You don't. Okay. Well, you can go visit mine. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, Richard, for joining us. Thank you for everything you do for our youth in the community and for all the work that you have always do for the community. Well, thank you, Fabi, for allowing me to, uh, uh, you know, to participate and uh, to share a little bit of, uh, you know, some information that I have. And you're coming back because we said the next time you're here, we're going to talk about... Well, I do a lot of uh, child abuse cases, so uh, perhaps I could do an overview of child protective services. Okay, so well, yeah, let's do that. How do you, what do you guys think, child protective services? And let's talk about, you know, what we can do when we see something happening and what we shouldn't do. So yeah, let's have you back. Okay. Maybe next month you can save a Wednesday for us. Sure, whenever you have time. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us, and make sure you share this video. Bye. Ciao, ciao.